Hello everyone and uh, welcome back. Uh, today uh, we are going to uh, study sedimentary rocks uh, in lesson 4.4. 4. Uh, like we did in the previous lesson for igneous rocks, we are going to look at uh, different, uh, different uh, processes in which sedimentary rocks form and uh, uh, what are their uh, major uses and engineering issues involved with the sedimentary terrains. But before we start, we are going to uh, examine the questions that were given in the previous uh, lesson. Uh, the first question that was asked was which of the following types of volcanic rocks would be more resistant to weathering, gabbro and granite. Now, the uh, if you recall the subject matter of last lesson, then gabbro is actually uh, much more, it, it contains a much more, much larger proportion of uh, mafic minerals in comparison with granites. Uh, as a result, you would expect that gabbro is more resistant to weathering, uh, uh, sorry, it is going to be more susceptible to weathering really uh, in comparison with granite. Uh, but uh, because of the fact that mafic minerals in general are more susceptible to weathering, uh, chemical weathering, but there are several other issues that also comes into consideration in this case. Uh, those issues include the joints and uh, compact nature of these particular rocks and as a result, the susceptibility of a given uh, piece of rock to weathering, to chemical weathering is going to vary uh, by a significant margin uh, uh, in, and that may sometimes override the mineralogical, consider mineralogical considerations when we look at the susceptibility uh, to chemical weathering. Now the second question that was asked was what is the difference between the words structure and texture. Now, I indicated in the last lesson itself that by structure what we mean is the macroscopic uh, characteristics of a rock mass whereas by the word texture we are really looking at mineralogic, we are looking at a microscopic scale. So examples of structure, if you consider the examples uh, that I gave in the last lesson, uh, structures are governed by things like joint set uh, or the lava form or the lava forms that may end up being retained after solidification of the lava like uh, different types of uh, uh, formation uh, because of uh, viscosity of lava like pillow uh, lava and other things whereas uh, in the texture the word texture uh, is uh, it, it signifies uh, it signifies microscopic nature of the orientation or distribution of different types of mineralogical comp components uh, within the matrix within the matrix uh, which is normally not crystalline and the, the, the orientation of these these features within the matrix or it could be even, even distribution of uh, of uh, gas bubbles that was uh, that was there when the lava was in molten uh, in partially molten state and the gas bubbles were forming because of escape of uh, dissolved gases uh, like vesicular texture or uh, uh, for that matter uh, we have uh, uh, we have uh, phanaritic texture, aphanitic texture and so on and so forth. The third question that was asked was what are the meanings of xenolithic and porphyritic. Now xenolithic by the word xenolithic what is meant is a foreign rock material, foreign piece of uh, a piece of rock really of uh, uh, which is a remnant of of uh, which is a remnant of of uh, other types of rock that is included within a mass of volcanic rock. 
uh, and these xenoliths are normally they, they often times they react with the with the with the parent rock which is the major proportion of the rock mass and give rise to a structure called reacting structure. The other term porphyritic that actually is a type of texture and if you recall porphyritic texture is composed of minerals of different sizes. Some of the minerals could grow very large in comparison with other minerals and uh, if you recall actually let me draw a porphyritic structure to recall uh, to actually jog your memory. Uh, if you have got a mass of rock of say this size, um, most of the minerals may be are going to be of that nature. Let us say there is a distribution of similar size uh, crystals, but then within the matrix there will be some crystals which are quite large in comparison with the general crystal size. So, the, so these are all rock crystals in this case, these are all crystals. crystals uh, and the larger crystals are known as phenocrysts. Now this step if you recall uh, from what we discussed in the previous class, previous lesson, uh, the size of mineral really is a function of how fast the lava is cooling as, as a result uh, porphyritic structure actually porphyritic uh, texture it arises because of a variable cooling rate that may actually be encountered during the lava solidification and crystallization process. The fourth question that I asked was which one among extrusive and intrusive igneous rocks is likely to contain the smallest proportion of crystalline matter. Now here uh, again as I indicated when I was answering the previous question uh, the, the cooling rate is the major, major consideration and if you have got a smaller cooling rate or the cooling rate is quite slow in that case the crystal for, crystals are going to, uh, going to grow quite large whereas if you have got if you have got much larger uh, uh, actually much la uh, where the, the cooling rate is much faster in that case the crystal sizes are going to become very small. And you could actually extend that and for the fastest cooling magma what you are going to end up with is a texture called glassy texture where crystalline matter is almost non-existent and what you have got is a glass like matter, glass like solid. So what we see then is for extrusive rock since the cooling rate is much faster and cooling, uh, cooling normally as I mentioned takes place in the matter of few hundred days. So in this case the faster cooling rate is going to end up being translated into smaller crystal size in comparison with intrusive rocks because they actually in this case the magma solidifies at a much slower pace and the solidification process can prolong over uh, several hundreds of thousands of years. So with that actually wraps up the question set and now we hop on to the subject matter of this particular lesson. What we are going to discuss here today is essentially origin, uh, origin, evolution uh, and the processes, uh, processes involved in origin and evolution 
of different types of sedimentary rocks and also we are going to look at uh, so the objectives here objectives of this lesson would be to be able to be able to dis uh, discuss formation processes of different types of sedimentary rocks evolution of sedimentary rocks classification of sedimentary rocks and then we are going to consider engineering uses and issues that are relevant in sedimentary rock areas. So, these are the major objectives that we want to uh, take care of in this particular lesson. Okay. So, heading back, what is meant by sedimentary rock? That is the first question that comes in mind. Uh, sedimentary rock actually forms from disintegration, accumulation, compaction, consolidation uh, and cementation of sediments which primarily form from the, uh, from the physical and chemical weathering of pre-existing rock mass. And actually the solid matter could also be deposited because of organic activity or chemical activities, chemical deposition processes. Now sedimentary rock by far is the, uh, it covers the largest proportion of the, uh, of the earth's surface or within the near surface layers which is of primary importance in engineering geology. Uh, the rock that is mostly in abundance that is sedimentary rock and approximately 70 percent of the, uh, of the area of the continental area is covered uh, basically by sedimentary rocks. So, you can imagine that uh, from engineering standpoint sedimentary rock is going to be uh, going to be going to be of, of greatest importance. Okay. Now, the first thing that we do is to try to classify sedimentary rock. Uh, sedimentary rocks are primarily classified depending on whether they are mainly composed of uh, detrital matter uh, in which case the type of sedimentary rock is called clastic rock uh, detrital, uh, composed of detrital matter. These things are composed mainly of detrital matter and by that what I mean is fragments or mineral remnants of pre-existing rock or volcanic ash or mineral pieces which may arise because of uh, decaying organic matter like for example shell fragments or other uh, remnants of coral reef and so on and so forth. So, this type of rock which is which is going to be which is mainly uh, uh, granular in going to be granular somewhat granular in nature that is going to be known as clastic rock. Whereas, you could also have non clastic rock, non clastic rock is going to be composed of non detrital uh, material and these things are mainly uh, mainly deposited because of organic activity or they could be chemical precipitate chemical deposits like precipita precipitates from uh, saturated solution of some kind of uh, chemical uh, species. So, then we have got two types to contend with primarily one is detrital sedimentary rock or clastic sedimentary rock 
and the other one is non clastic or non detrital sedimentary rock. Now, we try to take a look to begin with at the typical compositions of different types of sedimentary rock. At the top left, we have got a typical composition of limestone and here you can see by far the largest proportion uh, is that of uh, calcium oxide. And then there are several other oxides like iron oxide or magnesium oxide and uh, other minerals. Like there is a minor proportion of silica as well. Uh, by the way, all these uh, pie charts shown here are color coded. So, one particular type of color is used to denote a particular uh, mineral species. So, this one here is the silica. Uh, the orange the orange color uh, the orange color is used to denote alumina the light yellow color is used to denote uh, oxides of iron uh, the the light green color is used to denote uh, oxides of magnesium oxide of magnesium uh, that's about it now so this one here is a chemical is a chemical chemically formed is an example of chemically formed non clastic sedimentary rock. And then at the middle we have got an example of a mineral uh, of a of a uh, clastic sedimentary rock. Uh, this is basically uh, this basically it is called shale basically forms from deposition, compaction and lithification of clay and here you can see the largest component, largest mineral component that is present within the rock mass is silica and then there is an abundance, abundance of alumina, uh, oxides of iron and other chemical species as well. So, basic, basically most abundant compo component of this particular class of rock is silica and alumina and that actually continues through to another clastic species of sedimentary rock called sandstone. As the name suggests this type of, this type of rock actually forms from sand beds. Uh, when sand beds get deposited under pressure and become Lithifi becomes lithified, then the rock that you get in that process is called sandstone and here also the largest component uh, like in the previous case is silica and then you have got a large proportion of alumina as well. But the proportion of silica in this case is typically larger than the proportion of silica in case of shale. So, you can see that there is a wide variety of sedimentary rocks that could be uh, that could that that one has to count uh, one has to come across uh, as far as the mineralogical composition goes. Okay. Now, a few pictures showing a showing uh, some of the abundant uh, types of uh, sedimentary rocks on the left the picture on the left shows a section of a rock called conglomerate and this type of rock you can see is composed of gravel and cobble size uh, uh, cobble size detrital matter uh, these are really fragments of pre-existing weathered uh, rock pieces. So, these are the gravels and cobbles
and then these things are bounded uh, by, uh, these things are binded basically by uh, cementitious material which also cementing agents which also in this case is of siliceous variety containing a lot of silica. Now at the center here the middle we have got a, uh, a picture of pink sandstone in this case the rock mass actually rock develops because of lithification of sand beds as is evident from the picture there and on the right here what you have got you have got a limestone and also of interest in this case here you have got a very large fossil within the mass of limestone. Now, limestone actually often times contain a lot of fossil and that type of rock is called uh, uh, how this type of rock is classified we will discuss in more detail as the uh, lesson continues. Now the scale of these particular pictures are indicated at the bottom of the uh, just immediately below the pictures. So uh, in order to give you an idea about uh, what is the what are the size of different types of aggregates uh, that form these rocks. Okay. So with that said we are going to revert back to the uh, presentation. Now what we look at we try to look at the, proce the processes that are involved in the formation of clastic sedimentary rocks to begin with then we are going to look at the processes afterwards uh, that are involved in, in, uh, in formation of non clastic sedimentary rocks. So to begin with uh, clastic rocks, clastic rocks actually form from physical and chemical weathering of pre existing rock and they also form from uh, deposition of biogenic matter and lithification uh, of these detrital matter by some cementing agent. So the processes involved then they include breaking down uh, of the pre existing rock mass into smaller fragments and chemical weathering. Then the second step in the formation process is transportation of these uh, of these debris deposition accumulation and deposition of these debris and once the uh, once the clasts they deposit and there is they actually get deposited underneath a heavy sediment load on top of it then what is going to happen is a process called compaction uh, in which the intergranular pore space become smaller and smaller and this leads to expulsion of pore fluids comp comp uh, comprised mainly of, uh, of air and water and following this or through this entire process there could be an ongoing diagenesis process and we know from what we have done so far in this course what is meant by diagenesis. Diagenesis actually uh, indicate uh, chemical, physical or geometric alteration of the parent uh, rock forming material and then finally after, after all these all after the plastic matter goes through all these processes what you are going to have is cementation and in this case the grains may get cemented because of deposition of calcareous uh, or silica cements near the intergranular contacts or in between the grains in between the uh, clasts uh, or the grains could be pressure welded leading to the formation of the plastic rock. So the formation process then begins with chemical or physical weathering 
and then the, the rock debris can actually be transported to another location and get deposited under pressure, accumulate and deposit, get deposited under pressure and uh, then it get compact, it gets uh, compacted under pressure and then finally, uh, the material gets cemented and what you get is a mass of plastic rock. And the process of chemical weathering can actually proceed through the entire uh, rock forming process as indicated on these slides. Now, we try to look at the types of plastic rock or a type of classific a, 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 an approach for classification of plastic rocks. You could classify plastic rocks depending on the grain size that composes the major proportion of the plastic rock. So, if you have got if you have got very coarse grained or heterogeneous rock, it is called argillaceous, lutaceous or rudites. Examples for this type of rock is conglomerate, a picture of which we have already seen or you could have another type of rock which is called brescia and what is brescia is in uh, brescia is in fact uh, angular pieces of pre-existing volcanic rock bound by a matrix of cementitious material. Then uh, as the grain size becomes smaller, we could have arenaceous rock and these things are also composed of primarily coarse grained material. Uh, by coarse grained what I mean is the grains that are visible to naked eye and these coarse grain material could be pressure welded or they could be cemented uh, by silica or calcareous uh, cements. Example of this type of rock is sandstone and finally, when the as the grain size becomes even finer, then we could end up with rudaceous rock or lutites as they are called. These things are fine grained rocks packed together uh, with compaction. Example of that is shale which we have discussed uh, to some extent in the preceding. Okay, so, these are actually three classes of plastic rocks depending on uh, the grain size and these terms, these terms, the terms rudite, uh, arenite and lutites, these terms are also used for classifying non-clastic rocks. Uh, con uh, non plastic rocks containing carbonates. So, for example, you could have you could have uh, calcirudite. Uh, what is going to what is going to what we are going to mean by that is a uh, limestone which has got coarse grained uh, coarse grain uh, coarse grained texture, or you could have calciarenite, which is of intermediate grain size limestone again but of intermediate grain size and calcilutite which has got a much finer grained limestone. This is important because the permeability of a rock mass or rock mass after weathering is affected to a large extent uh, by the property by the, uh, by the grain size of the primary component of the rock mass. Okay. So, uh, a more refined classification of plastic rock. So, here what we do is we use a tool called ternary diagram and wh how, what is meant by ternary diagram is we are going to, we are going to uh, see in the next little bit. The first ternary diagram that we are going to consider is called a QFL diagram what is meant by QFL is really quartz, feldspar and lithic. So, this looks at the mineralogical composition of the rock mass relative we look at the relative abundance of the quartz component, feldspar component and rock fragments. 
So, if the rock is uh, composed mainly of quartz, then we are going to call it quartz something. If it is, if it is uh, containing most of uh, feldspar, then they are called arcoses. And if it contains fragments of pre-existing rock, then these things, the rock, uh, the sedimentary rock is going to be called lithic sedimentary rock. Then after we actually classify according to the mineralogy, then we consider the texture of the sedimentary rock. And in this case, we are going to use another uh, couple of uh, ternary diagrams depending on whether it is composed of uh, very coarse aggregates like gravels and cobbles or if they are, con if they are composed of sands or finer grains. And finally, we are going to give a name to a particular type of sedimentary rock. Uh, the sizes of different types of uh, texture is indicated here at the bottom of this slide. So, by gravel what we mean is a, um, is a, is a clust that has got greater than 2 millimeter size. Sands on the other hand will range from 1 16th of a millimeter to 2 millimeter and silts are going to be from 1 16th to 1 over 256 millimeter. Okay. So, these are the ternary diagrams. So, what we, what we said in the previous uh, slide is that first we are going to, we are going to consider the QFL diagram. So, this is this here is your QFL diagram and what it is actually it is a it is a triangle and you plot the composition of a given type of rock on this particular triangle and if it if it actually plots to the left bottom of towards the left bottom portion of this particular diagram then it is going to be called a feldspathic uh, rock whereas and, and, and whereas, if it plots near the bottom right, then the rock mass is going to be composed mainly of pre-existing rock fragments. In that case, what we got is a lithic clastic rock, whereas if the rock plots near the apex, near the top of the uh, QFL diagram, then we have got a quartz rock. And there are some intermediate, uh, intermediate areas within this ternary diagram uh, in which case if it is on the left cent near the left top center of this particular diagram uh, out here then we are going to call it sub arcosic rock and if it is in this area then we are going to call it a sublithic rock now you you carefully look at the uh, the uh, the border lines that actually separate these different areas and the percentage that separate these areas are indicated along the edges of this particular triangle. For example, the differentiating line in between feldspathic and lithic uh, rock type is at 50 percent composition of feldspar and 50 percent lithic, uh, whereas uh, the the lines that separate sublithic from lithic is at 75 percent lithic uh, fragment lithic uh, composition and the one that actually differentiates between sublithic and quartz is at 90 percent uh, uh, 90 percent uh, uh, lithic composition uh, actually 90 percent uh, 90 percent quartz composition so if you are if you are if you are uh, if you are near the top then the rock is composed mostly of quartz so along this particular edge along the right edge actually proportion of quartz increases proportion of quartz increases whereas as you climb down on the right edge along the right edge of the QFL diagram the proportion of the lithic fragment increases. Whereas, uh, as you move along the bottom edge of this particular diagram then 
the lithic proportion decreases and feldspar proportion increases while uh, if you actually climb up along the left edge of this particular diagram then the quartz proportion increases and feldspar proportion decreases. So, that in a nutshell uh, is the QFL diagram and in addition to that what you have to consider are two diagrams that looks at the texture of these different types of uh, rocks and what you have got on the middle ternary diagram is the composition by percent of the uh, of different sizes of grains. If it composes mostly of sand then the rock is going to plot near the top of this particular diagram whereas if it is composed mostly of silt it is going to compo it is going to plot near the bottom left of this diagram whereas if it is composed of clay uh, particles then the rock is going to plot near the bottom right of this particular diagram. Again you have got some intermediate areas to consider in this case uh, and the the uh, the I mean the percentages of different components that actually differentiate these different uh, classes are also indicated along the margin of this particular ternary diagram. And finally, if you have got uh, rocks that are composed uh, that are composed to some extent uh, by very coarse grain material like uh, gravel or cobble size, then you are going to use the ternary diagram near the bottom right of this particular slide. So, here what you have got if the if the rock is composed mainly of matrix that is uh, mainly a matrix non detrital uh, non clastic matter then it is going to plot near the bottom right whereas if it is composed mainly of sand then the rock is going to plot near the bottom left and if it is composed mainly of gravel uh, size or coarser material then the rock is going to plot near the top of this particular ternary diagram. And how you are going to name these different types of rocks that is also indicated there. Uh, let us let us take an example. So, if you for instance if you have got a rock that uh, plots at this location. So, let us call it rock A. So, how do you how we are going to classify or how you are going to name this particular rock. So, what we are going to do we are going to look at the least abundant material first. So, in this case the least abundant material is going to be quartz and then we are going to look at the next least abundant material that in this case is going to be feldspar. So, this thing is going to be quartz actually arcosic, feldspathic, uh, lithic something. So, this particular rock after we complete this step is going to be arcosic. feldspathic lithic something and this something for for finding out what is meant by this question mark we have to go to the next step in which we are going to move over to the uh, to the next ternary diagram let us say uh, rock a is composed uh, composed mainly of uh, mainly of sand grains and it plots it plots near the top of the ternary diagram uh, to top of the middle ternary diagram. So, this is the location where rock A plots on the central ternary diagram. So, in this case what is going to happen how we are going to name this particular rock is we are going to call this one lithic sandstone 
you should notice. So, rock A in this case is arcosic, feldspathic, lithic sandstone. Now, uh, what is actually what is the meaning of this particular thing is that you first go into the QFL diagram, you try to classify the rock and then move over to the texture uh, ternary diagram and try to add uh, try to actually complete the classification of the rock. Now, in this case we used the ternary diagram near the bottom center of this particular slide, but had it contained a large proportion of gravel or coarser size material, then we had we would have had to use the ternary diagram which is near the bottom right of this particular slide. So, a lot of information on this slide and I am going to actually leave it up there for the next little bit uh, in order to uh, in order to allow you to assimilate uh, the different types different components of these ternary diagrams used in classification of clastic sedimentary rocks. Okay. Now, then we have to actually move over to the classification of non clastic uh, or, or we have to look at the genesis and types of non clastic sedimentary rocks. And as we have mentioned earlier that non clastic sedimentary rocks could form from chemical or biogenic processes and rock forming processes in this case includes in case of chemically formed rocks precipitation primarily actually these are the primary uh, processes involved precipitation evaporation or crystallization in case of biogenic uh, sedimentary rock what you have got accumulation of animal uh, accumulation of biogenic material burial and disintegration so these are the processes that actually are involved mainly in development of non clastic sedimentary rocks okay first of all we try to consider we uh, what is meant by what, what are the different types of chemically formed rocks in case of chemically formed rocks you if you recall these rocks form primarily from uh, evaporation precipitation evaporation uh, and precipitation of matter primarily from inorganic processes although in this case some biogenic activity could also uh, could also uh, catalyze the rock forming process now the types of rocks here include siliceous deposits siliceous deposits form mainly by evaporation of saturated silica solution uh, how these different types of silica solutions actually form in the aqueous uh, uh, form is going to be examined later when we look at chemical weathering examples of this type of rock include flint chart and jasper then you have got carbonate deposits these are primarily precipitates from carbonate rich water solution uh, carbonate rich aqueous solution and examples of this class of rock includes limestone and dolomite you could have ferruginous deposits uh, these things these deposits chemically form from uh, to, to form some uh, iron ores and they are often times uh, catalyzed by organic activities. Then you have got phosphatic deposits, uh, sea water rich in phosphate, phosphoric acid uh, leads to the formation of phosphates, rock phosphates uh, primarily from inorganic uh, uh, pro, uh, through ino inorganic processes. And finally, we have got evaporites which forms from evaporation of saturated solu of solutions 
and the type of rock type uh, types of rock that actually arise from this type of uh, uh, process include gypsum anhydrite and rock salt now in the chemical processes that actually give rise to the formation of chemically formed rocks are affected by a number of environmental factors. So, these rock formation processes actually accentuate or they might get impeded under some environmental conditions. So, what are those conditions? They include whether a certain type of mineral is available or not and here what is important is the mineralogy of the parent material as well as the chemistry of fluid. Then the second thing that is important here uh, is temperature as well as pressure. Uh, this actually affects dissolution of different types of gases and they sometimes impede or, or catalyze exothermic or endothermic reactions or reactions in which the volume increases and also pH of the environment what is the concentration of hydrogen ion that also is another important uh, environmental factor that is that affects the chemical process. Now, we actually want to have a look quick look at the formation process that leads to the development of carbonate rocks, carbonate rock formation. So, in this case the chemical reactions that are involved uh, include formation of carbonic acid by dissolution of uh, ambient uh, carbon dioxide into water and reaction between calcite and carbonic acid. Uh, giving rise to released calcium ion and uh, uh, re release of different ions in the aqueous uh, solution. So, in this case you should notice the uh, reactions can proceed both ways and what happens actually depending on the environmental condition sometimes forward reaction gets accentuated or sometimes the backward reaction gets accentuated. For example, if you have got an elevated temperature then dissolution of carbon dioxide in water actually is impeded in that case formation of carbonic acid is impeded as a result the, uh, the reaction mainly proceeds the, the bottom reaction mainly proceeds to the left and in this case what you are going to have you are going to this is going to lead to the uh, deposition or precipitation of limestone. Whereas, if you have got a reverse uh, environmental condition that means you have got a low temperature environment in that case uh, it is going to lead to the dissolution of, uh, of limestone into aqueous solution. Okay. So, biologically formed rocks they form because of direct contribution of, bi bio of uh, biologic organisms and in this case rocks can be subdivided into different categories. You could have carbonate rocks, they f these, this class of carbonate rocks actually form by gradual accumulation of shells and skeletal matter and you could have carbonaceous rocks like anthracite or bituminous coal. Uh, classification of biogenic carbonate rock in this case uh, the classifying scheme includes the naming of the allochems. Uh, by allochems what is meant is the clastic component, clastic component and you also need to have you need to describe the interstitial cementitious material or the matrix. So, 
if if the allochems contain a lot of fossils in this case the rocks will have a uh, a set of letters uh, called bio or it could if it contains oolites which is actually chemical precipitate of calcium carbonate which looks like uh, round nodules in this case you are going to have a double o in the naming of that or it could have uh, excreta of biogenic matter in that case you will have a pell in the name of the rock or if it is intraclasts broken uh, debris of pre existing rock then you will have something by the name intra in the name of the rock then you will have micrite if it is if the interstitial matter is mainly uh, of micrite formed of micrite this is a calcite cement uh, form in quiescent water uh, or sparite sparite actually uh, is a is a uh, is a figment of a strong current environment it is also of calcite uh, it is it is composed of calcite cement examples of this type of classification includes usparite or palo biomicrite or you could combine you could have you could have several different combinations of these phrases as are indicated uh, above okay then there could be several different structures of uh, of sedimentary rock the main thing main structure type is bedding then bedding could be thinly bedded there could be thin laminations of uh, of thin laminae of different types of, uh, of different types of uh, material or there could be a gradational layering uh, or the sedimentary rock could be massive uh, which does not show any bedding as such and this these things uh, massive bedding is typical of clay stone or limestone fine fine uh, fine grained sedimentary rocks whereas uh, thin and gradational bedding is typical of coarser grained sedimentary rocks like sandstone then there could be ripple marks lenses and nodules or there could be other uh, remnants of water activity of water flowing water like current cyclic and dune what we mean by these things let me quickly explain uh, for example thin bedding is going to be of this type then you could have gradational bedding in this case within a particular bed the gradation of the clastic matter is going to progressively change so you can see what is meant by gradational bedding and this one is thin bedding then you could have uh, ripple marks so within the structure of the rock you have got marks of ripples of water activity so this is ripple mark and then in addition to it there could be several remnants of uh, of biogenic and inorganic activities that might be ongoing during the lithification process like there could be remnant mud cracks or uh, or remnant cross bedding uh, in fluvial environments uh, the, then we look at the major engineering issues that affect the terrains uh, underlain by sedimentary rock main problem here includes the terrains uh, in, in limestone, limestone terrain where li a portion of limestone can get dissolved in water leading to the development of karst topography and these type of areas are affected by subsidence because uh, because the overburden on top of a hollow dug out by activity of water may actually subside then there could be gouges and slicken side that may be developing 
at the inter beds because of chemical weathering these all these things actually can lead to strength loss on exposure to air or environment and creep and this type of problem is a frequent problem in case of shaley areas shale terrains so this one is a problem in case of a limestone terrain uh, this is also a problem of karst areas finally we look at the uses engineering uses of sedimentary rocks sedimentary rocks are used in uh, in uh, manufacturing of portland cement paper glass and steel making uh, limestone is a major ingredient in that case uh, sandstone is a very major building material and aggregate resource and as you all know coal is used as fuel to summarize this lecture included formation and classification of sedimentary rock we looked at composition and texture of sedimentary rocks we looked at structures of sedimentary rocks and we looked at engineering issues and uses and finally we end this particular lesson with a question set you try to answer these questions at your leisure the first question is that with increased temperature pressure and ph formation of limestone limestone is accelerated or impeded then second question is seawater is considered to be a major ingredient necessary for dolomite formation why that is so and the third question is explain the following terms ripple marks and gradational bedding try to answer these questions and i will be providing you with the answers when we meet uh, for the next lesson so until we meet bye for now thank you hello everyone and uh, welcome back to the new lesson of uh, engineering geology uh, today we are going to talk about sediment transport and deposition uh, you if you recall in the last lesson we were talking about uh, soil formation and we talked about uh, some uh, some soil uh, deposits which didn't get transported away from the location from where they formed uh, and today we are going to talk about uh, soil deposits that uh, are uh, that are developed uh, away from the location where they form and the process in between the uh, in situ weathering and the deposition elsewhere uh, involved in this case is called transportation we are going to look at the details of all the uh, different uh, 